All right, so today we're going to finish up uh, chapter 8 looking at meiosis, gamete formation, and then some early stages of development. So as we start thinking about cell division, mitosis, and meiosis, I want to talk a little bit about chromosomes, and let's use ourselves, humans, as example. And we know that as humans, our cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And so each cell has 46 pieces of DNA, or 46 chromosomes. Now the reason we say 23 pairs of chromosomes, instead of just saying 46, is that our chromosomes come in these homologous pairs. And homo as a prefix always means the same, and so a homologous pair of chromosomes, we're going to get two copies of each chromosome, one copy from each of your parents. And so those two homologous chromosomes, the one you got from mom, the one you got from dad, are going to be very similar in terms of their genetic content, their DNA. Physically, they're going to be similar shapes and similar sizes. They're going to look a lot alike under the microscope, for example. But those two homologous chromosomes of each type are not identical. Obviously, you might have inherited different genes from one parent than you did from the other. Now, of those 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, 22 of them are going to be the same, whether you're male or female. And we call that an autosomal chromosome. And so 22 out of our 23 pairs are autosomal chromosomes. We've all two copies of each of those. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. That 23rd pair, then, our last pair of chromosomes, is the sex chromosome. Okay? And we've each got a pair of sex chromosomes, but they're going to be different depending on whether you're male or female. And we can take a look at your chromosomes and physically, how many do you have? Can we pair them up in those homologous pairs, determining sex by looking at sex chromosomes? We can do that through what's called a karyotype. In a karyotype, we're just going to stain your DNA during cell division, and we're going to physically kind of cut and paste the chromosomes and try to match them all up to look at your specific set of DNA. And this figure just shows us a karyotype. Usually they're going to get your DNA from blood because blood cells are easy to get. We're going to isolate those blood cells and look at the DNA. And we can see on the bottom right there, we can see what a typical karyotype would look like. We're going to stain the DNA uh, and then kind of match up all those different pairs. And if we were looking at a woman's karyotype, she would have 22 autosomal pairs, and then her thir 23rd pair of those sex chromosomes, she would have two copies of the X chromosome. And so when they do a karyotype, here's an example of the DNA from one cell. It's been stained to give those kind of very specific banding patterns on DNA. And it's kind of a whole mix of DNA. And so they're going to go in and cut and paste and match up and try to pair up all those homologous chromosomes. So here's what the karyotype looks like after we've kind of paired up or sorted out the DNA. Now notice chromosomes labeled numbers 1 through 22. Those represent those 22 autosomal chromosomes. Again, they're going to be the same for men or women. And they're arranged basically by size. Number one is the largest chromosome with the most DNA. 22 and 21 are the smallest two chromosomes. And then the sex chromosomes there, we can see she has two copies of the X. That's what makes her a she. Uh, notice the X chromosomes are pretty large, about average size. So there's a lot of DNA on those X chromosomes. And really for women, your X chromosomes aren't much different than the other 22 pairs. You've got two copies of X. One came from each parent, just like you've got two copies of number eight or two copies of number four. Now we'll see a different combination, though, if we look at a man's karyotype. And men are going to have 22 autosomal pairs, but the sex chromosomes are going to be the XY. And so here's male DNA from a cell that's been stained. And again, if we sort it out, here's what our final karyotype would look like. And again, for chromosomes 1 through 22, it looks pretty much the same as a woman's largest to smallest. We've got two copies, one from each parent. But with our sex chromosomes, we've got an X and a Y chromosome. And so for men, the sex chromosomes are very different than the other 22 because we've got two different chromosomes. And in particular, we always know where they came from. If I were, for example, to look at chromosome number 10, I don't know which of those chromosome number 10s came from mom and which came from dad because they look so similar. But with the sex chromosomes in men, we can tell them apart. Because the X is so much bigger, I know that X had to come from mom because men get our Y from dad because dad's the only one that has a Y and could pass it on to his son. And so we can keep track of where each individual sex chromosome came from in men because they physically look different. Also, notice how small the Y chromosome is. The Y is by far the puniest of all the uh, chromosomes in humans. It has the least amount of DNA. And the DNA that's on there mostly has to do with male reproduction, things like sperm production and metabolism and so on. If we were to look at all of your cells, you've got two different types of cells based on your DNA. Most of the cells in your body, 99 plus percent of your cells, are referred to as somatic cells. And again, those are going to be almost all of your cells in your body. The only type of cell that's different are the gametes. And so sperm cells or egg cells are genetically different. But all of your other cells are all exactly the same, and they're all what we would call diploid. And di as a prefix means two, and so a diploid cell has two copies of each homologous chromosome. 
And so that's what we were just looking at on those karyotypes, were diploid cells. They were somatic cells. They're going to have 23 pairs in humans or 46 total chromosomes. And somatic cells, skin cell, muscle, bone, cartilage, any cell you can think of in your body except for an egg or sperm would be a somatic cell. Genetically distinct, then, are your gametes, your egg or your sperm cells, because they're going to have half as much DNA as the rest of your cells. And that's referred to as being haploid, where you've only got one copy of each homologous chromosome. So a gamete would only have one of those two sex chromosomes, either an X or a Y. It would have one copy of chromosome numbers 1 through 22. And so it's only going to have 23 total chromosomes in a haploid gamete. And since we have two different types of cells, we have to have these two different types of cell division. So we already talked about mitosis, growth and repair, and in other organisms, asexual reproduction that can reproduce that way. All of our somatic cells are genetic clones or copies that have come from mitosis. But because our gametes are different, they only have half as much DNA, we have to have meiosis, a different type of cell division that's going to cut the amount of DNA in a diploid cell in half to form that egg or sperm. And here in the picture we see our human life cycle. This is referred to sometimes as alternation of generation. We all started off as that diploid zygote, having two sets of DNA. Through lots of mitosis, as adults now, we're trillions of cells, all these somatic cells. Some of those cells, either in the testes or the ovaries, will undergo meiosis and generate haploid sperm or egg, each having half, having half as much DNA. When egg and sperm fuse together, we get back to diploid. So we kind of alternate between haploid and diploid and certainly in humans, the bulk of our cells in life are spent in diploid, and it's only as gametes that we see the haploid part of our generation. Meiosis is absolutely critical for sexual reproduction to occur. And just to kind of reinforce that, let's take a look at an example. Let's say we just had mitosis as our only type of cell division. Well, if that was the case in the ovaries, when a cell with 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes in humans undergoes mitosis, we know it makes a genetic clone. So our, the egg cell would be a clone of all the other somatic cells, and a sperm cell would be a clone of all the other cells. And if that was the case, though, when egg and sperm fuse together to make that zygote, the next generation would have 92 pieces of DNA. It would have twice as much DNA. And so if mitosis was our only form of cell division, we could not have sexual reproduction because the amount of DNA would basically be doubling every generation. And so that is absolutely not the way things occur. Too much DNA is a real problem for our cells. Instead, we have meiosis. So in the ovaries and testes, those diploid cells are going to undergo meiosis, which is going to cut the chromosome number in half. So an egg cell has half as much DNA as a typical somatic cell. So does a sperm cell. And then when those two fuse together to form the zygote, it returns us back to 46 chromosomes. And so meiosis allows for sexual reproduction to occur, but keeps the chromosome number the same one generation after another. If we look at a quick overview of mitosis then, again, meiosis is only going to occur for sexual reproduction, so only in the ovaries or the testes. The original parent cell that starts meiosis is going to be diploid. As it goes through meiosis then, those final cells, those daughter cells, are going to be haploid, so we're cutting that chromosome number in half. Now meiosis is a little bit more complex than mitosis because it is going to be changing the DNA amount, and meiosis involves two divisions. And so one diploid parent splits into two cells, each of those two cells split a second time, or a second division, into four haploid daughter cells. And so we're going to see a little bit more complex pattern here. Now having said that, many things are similar between meiosis and mitosis. For example, that cell cycle, the G1S and G2 of, my, of interface, is the same, regardless of whether the cell divides by mitosis or meiosis. So that part's going to be the same. Um, also, many of the stages are the same. The prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, those basic ideas in mitosis are going to apply here to meiosis. And so what I'm going to do is just briefly go through meiosis. And instead of going through every stage, I just want to point out where are some differences that makes meiosis different compared to mitosis. And we signify meiosis with Roman numerals as meiosis 1 or meiosis 2, depending on what division. So meiosis 1 is the first division, one cell splitting into two. Meiosis 2 would be that second division, those two cells splitting again into four cells total. And so if this was our typical cell, here we've got our diploid cell. It has two copies of the big chromosome, two copies of the small. And let's say the green DNA represents information inherited from mom's side of the family, blue from dad's side of the family. Well, the cell's going to go through the cell cycle and get ready to divide. When it gets to prophase, we're going to see the cell building its spindle, 
breaking down his DNA, uh, nucleus, excuse me, and packaging up the DNA, all the things we saw in mitosis. But we're going to see one new thing here in meiosis 1, and that's the formation of what are called tetrads. Now, normally, your chromosomes in your cell are just kind of randomly spread out in your nucleus. But right before meiosis, during this prophase 1, your homologous chromosomes are going to be brought together and physically attached to each other. So chromosome number 17 that you inherited from mom and num number 17 from dad are going to physically be brought together and chemically bound together. And so for all 23 homologs, they're going to be bound together in these tetrads. And so this is a way for your cell to keep track of those homologous pairs, which is going to be important because we're going to cut that number in half here in just a second. And so that's a real critical difference here with meiosis. Once those tetrads are formed, the spindle's going to pull and push on the DNA. Eventually, it's going to line all those tetrads up down the middle. Oh, that's called metaphase again. Uh, again, notice now we don't have just individual chromosomes lined up, but we have the tetrads lined up. Now, during anaphase, that spindle's going to contract and pull apart our, te our uh, tetrads. Half of the DNA gets pulled up, half gets pulled down. And so this anaphase one is a critical stage where we're cutting the amount of DNA in half. We're going from two sets of DNA to one set. Remember, telophase is kind of our wrap-up stage, and so the cell's going to kind of undergo cytokinesis. It's going to make a new nucleus, unpack the DNA, get rid of the spindle. Again, kind of returning back to normal. So that by the end of meiosis I, we've cut our DNA amount in half. We've gone in humans from 46 to 23 chromosomes. In meiosis II, then our second division, these two cells are going to divide a second time. And notice as we start out that each of our chromosomes is made up of two of those identical sister chromatids. And this is the state of the DNA at the, form, at the beginning of mitosis. And in fact, meiosis II is very similar to mitosis uh, because what's going to happen is in prophase, we're going to package up the DNA. In metaphase, we're going to line up the chromosomes down the center of the cell. In anaphase II, the spindle is going to contract and it's going to pull apart those sister chromatids. In telophase, we're gonna, those cells are going to get back to normal. We're going to undergo that cytokinesis, that division of the cytoplasm build a new nucleus, and the cells are going to unwind. So that by the time we're finished, we've got four cells. They're not clones or identical to each other. They're all going to be haploid or have half as much DNA as that original parent cell. And so again, the critical stage is meiosis I and the formation of those tetrads that's going to result in our haploid cells. So if we put meiosis I and II together, let's just look at what happens into a, in a male cell, for example. And so here we're going to look at an autosomal chromosome, in this case, this A chromosome. If we were humans, again, there'd be 22 of those pairs. And then the uh, X and Y chromosomes. In meiosis I, we're going to cut the amount of DNA in half. So we're going to go from that two sets of DNA diploid to one set of DNA haploid. Then in meiosis II, we're going to split apart those sister chromatids. And so we're going to go from one parent to four haploid gametes. And so that's our process of meiosis. It doesn't matter whether I'm looking at a plant cell or a human cell or some other type of animal. This process is the same for all eukaryotic cells and is absolutely required for organisms that reproduce sexually with eggs and sperm. Once we have those gametes, then if fertilization is to occur, uh, the egg is released. When the egg is released, it's surrounded by many support cells, as we can see here. Uh, fertilization is that moment when egg and sperm fuse together. So the, egg, uh, the sperm actually has a little acrosome tip, which is a, at the very front of the sperm. It's an enzyme-filled little cap. When it bounces into the egg, it releases the enzyme, which allows the sperm to wiggle in. As soon as that sperm enters the egg, uh, the egg releases what's called a fertilization barrier, which is a chemical barrier that prevents other sperm from getting in. Because certainly one of the problems is what happens if too many sperm get into the egg, we've got way too much DNA. And so it's a very immediate kind of response. As soon as that sperm enters, the fertilization pops up, barrier pops up, it prevents other sperm from getting in. And so now we've got two sets of DNA inside of our uh, egg, one from sperm, one from egg, and that's our diploid zygote. So we're returning back to two sets of DNA. And in humans, this can occur anywhere between the ovaries and certainly even within the uterus, but most commonly it's going to occur in the fallopian tubes, the tubes that connect the ovaries to the uterus is where we'll see uh, egg and sperm uh, join together or fertilization occurs. Biologically, we see that organisms spend a tremendous amount of effort and energy and nutrients to reproduce sexually. And so there seems to be a real benefit to sexual reproduction from that biological perspective. And the benefit is what's called genetic recombination, that every generation we're mixing up genes from two different individuals. We're not just cloning ourselves, but we're mixing up that DNA from two separate individuals. 
And again, that combination or recombination seems to be a huge benefit to species that reproduce sexually. The idea of being new combinations may be better suited to survive in the environment. Maybe they're better suited to avoid parasites or better suited to avoid infection like viruses and bacteria and so on. And there are three main mechanisms here that are going to increase the mixing up or the recombining of DNA during reproduction. One is called independent assortment. A second process is crossing over. And then finally, sexual reproduction itself. So we're going to take a quick look at these three mechanisms and how they're going to increase this genetic recombination or mixing up of our DNA. The first process here is independent assortment. And independent assortment refers to the orientation of those tetrads or those homologous chromosomes during meiosis. Okay? And this is going to be important because depending on where the chromosomes are lined up during that metaphase one of meiosis, that's going to determine where those chromosomes end up in terms of their gametes. So it's going to determine which chromosomes you're going to pass on in your egg or your sperm cells. And so defined here, independent assortment is that the orientation of one pair of homologous chromosomes during meiosis is independent of the orientation of all other pairs. And so as these chromosome tetrads line up during uh, metaphase of meiosis, again, their orientation is going to be critical here. And so, for example, let's look at possibility one. Let's say blue indicates chromosomes you inherited from dad's side of the family, red from mom's. So one possible that way they could line up with, is with dad's information on the left and mom's on the right. And if they happen to line up that way, after meiosis one and meiosis two, what we see is some of your gametes would contain your haploid information that you inherited from dad and some haploid information that you inherited from mom. But independent assortment tells us is that each pair of chromosomes lines up separate and it's very much like a coin flip. Heads, dad's information is on the left for this pair of chromosomes. Tails, mom's information is on the left for this pair of chromosomes. And so under, under possibility two, that bottom pair of chromosomes is flipped. And again, that's possible. It's a 50-50 shot. And just that simple flipping of that chromosome, though, means that when that possibility two cell undergoes meiosis, we're going to see a different combination of chromosomes. In some gametes, we're going to get dad's large and mom's small chromosome. In other gametes, just the opposite. Mom's large chromosome and dad's small. And so independent assortment is going to increase our mixing up of DNA because each pair of chromosomes has a 50-50 shot of how it's going to line up. And depending on how they line up, that's going to give us different combinations of DNA that we may pass on in our gametes. And looking at that last slide, it may not seem like a big deal. Well, there were four different gametes that can be made there. That doesn't sound like much. But that was looking at just two pairs of homologous chromosomes. Remember, as humans, we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. And during meiosis, all 23 pairs are going to assort independently, which means to figure out exactly how our chromosomes are going to line up, that's 23 coin flips, determining whose information is on the left and whose information is on the right. And mathematically, if, if we do that uh, equation, we come out with over 8 million different possible genetic gametes that we each have the potential to make just based on this flip-flopping. This really sounds like trivial uh, orientation of these chromosomes. But 2 to the 23rd is the, is the math problem there. Again, over 8 million different combinations. Now, we may not make these combinations, but we have the potential to generate all those different combinations of genes in sperm or egg cells simply based on independent assortment and meiosis. A second mechanism that increases genetic variation is called crossing over. And this is actually a mistake that happens in the DNA repair mechanisms, but it's a mistake that's going to actually be beneficial at times by increasing this genetic recombination. And so because DNA is very long and thin, it's not unusual for pieces of DNA to break, for chromosome pieces to break off, especially when the DNA is getting pulled and pushed around during cell division. But we have a whole series of enzymes and a whole metabolic pathway that allows our cells to find the broken piece and return it to the right place to fix it and to reattach it. This crossing over, though, is a breakdown in this repair mechanism. Because what happens during meiosis, when we have that tetrad formation, where mom's chromosome number seven and dad's chromosome number seven are really close together, is if both of those chromosomes happen to randomly break, instead of getting attached to the right place, they may get attached to the wrong homologous chromosome such that we end up sort of switching genetic information from one to the other. And the reason for that is homologous chromosomes are really similar. And so the cell's repair mechanism may kind of chemically get confused and attach the DNA to the wrong place, such that dad's broken piece gets attached to mom's chromosome 
and mom's broken piece to dad's. And if that happens, that creates a brand new chromosome, a brand new combination of DNA in your cell that's different than any DNA you inherited from either of your parents. And so that would be a new combination. So this crossing over is pretty rare because it is a genetic mistake, but if it happens, it's something that's sort of unrepeatable. It would be unlikely then to ever see that exact same break and crossing over occurring again in any of your other gametes. Finally then, we can also look at sexual reproduction itself. That when we reproduce, we're taking DNA from two completely different individuals and mixing that together. And so for example, if we were to look at your DNA and your parents and say, even if you had the exact same parents as you do, the exact same mother and father, what are the odds of getting the same genes that you have a second time and a second brother or sister being genetically identical to you? And basically the odds are mathematically zero. It's not going to happen because of all of this mixing up. Right? You're the result of one out of eight million different genetic eggs that your mom could have produced combined with one out of eight million different sperm that dad could produce. And so mathematically, to figure out the odds of your exact zygote, we'd have to take one in eight million times one in eight million, which is a, a really small number. I didn't do it because it's such a, a small number. And that doesn't even count any crossing over, which would be a one-time, unrepeatable kind of event. And so again, we're going to each end up with our unique DNA or a unique genetic identity. Because there's so much recombining and mixing up of DNA, between sexual reproduction and crossing over and independent assortment, we're never going to see the same combination more than once. Of course, there is an exception to that. There's always an exception to every rule. And our exception here would be identical twins. So let's take a minute to look at twins and see how that applies to this idea of genetic recombination and unique genetic identity. There are two types of twins. We're all familiar with fraternal versus identical twins. The scientific names of those, though, are dizygotic and monozygotic twins. And so a dizygotic twin, di is for two, so we've got twins from two zygotes. This is a scientific name for fraternal twins, and fraternal twins are the result of two eggs being fertilized by two separate sperm. And so we're going to have two zygotes, hence the name dizygotic. And dizygotic twins are basically genetic siblings. They're no more closely related than any brother or sister would be from the same two parents. And so here's a case where two eggs are released. Now normally mom's only going to release one egg per every month or 28 days or so, but if two eggs happen to be released from the ovary at the same time, then if there are sperm nearby, both of those eggs might be fertilized, and then we would have our dizygotic twins. And in fact, sometimes even dizygotic twins can be due to separate sperm from different males because of those two eggs being fertile at the same time. Dizygotic twins are the type of twins that may run in families because, especially on the mom's side of the family, Sometimes there's a tendency to release more than one egg at a time, and if that's the case, and that can be an inherited trait, then you may be more likely to have dizygotic twins. The only exception to our unique genetic identity rule, then, are monozygotic twins. And monozygotic twins is a scientific name for identical twins. And identical twins do have the exact same DNA because they came from a single egg that was fertilized by a single sperm. And so what happens in monozygotic twins is a sperm fertilizes an egg, that egg starts to develop by mitosis and divide into two cells, into four, into eight. And eventually, as it's moving down the fallopian tubes to the uterus to implant, for some reason, that clump of cells that makes up that developing embryo might split apart into more than one clump. And that would result in monozygotic twins. And so our split occurs after fertilization. So we've got an egg that gets fertilized by a sperm, and then that splits during development. And since our recombining of DNA of independent assortment and sexual reproduction and crossing over occurred before the formation of that zygote, any split after that is going to result in lots of division by mitosis, which of course makes genetic clones, and that's why mon monozygotic twins are going to be genetically identical to each other. When we start looking at production of gametes and sexual reproduction and all the stages of development and so forth, certainly it's amazing how complex it is. But even more amazing is how often things work out right, that all these natural processes occur and reproduction occurs as it should. However, sometimes there are mistakes that occur during these processes, and one of the most common mistakes during cell division is a process called non-disjunction. So I want to talk a little bit about this mistake, what it causes, and then sort of what are some of the effects that we might see in different cells. And non-disjunction can occur in mitosis or meiosis, but in meiosis, 
it's going to be much more magnified because that's a genetic mistake that you may pass on to your offspring versus mitosis. It's just going to affect one cell perhaps in your entire body. So non-disjunction in meiosis is when chromosomes don't separate. So normally during meiosis, the chromosomes get pulled apart during anaphase. But sometimes chromosomes are sticky and they stick together and they don't pull apart like they're supposed to. And if that happens, that's called non-disjunction. And it can occur in either chrom uh, meiosis 1 or 2. Here we see a picture in meiosis 1. Two chromosomes stick together. And if they do, after meiosis, some of the gametes have an extra chromosome. They have two copies of that large chromosome instead of the normal one. Other gametes are going to be missing a chromosome. So they don't have any copies of that particular uh, chromosome. And so in humans, instead of having 23, if we have non-disjunction, some of your, chrom your gametes might have four, others might only have 22. Now this could occur in meiosis too as well, and the result is pretty much the same. We'll get some gametes with an extra chromosome and some missing, although if it occurs in meiosis too, it affects fewer gametes. And as you might guess, if one of those gametes that are the result of non-disjunction, whether it's an egg or a sperm, that doesn't really matter, but if one of those gametes is involved in fertilization, that's going to have really serious health consequences because that means that original zygote that starts next generation is going to have a problem with the chromosome number, either too many or too few. And again, that's going to be pretty serious in terms of development. And so in this case, it's showing an egg with an extra chromosome from non-disjunction. It fuses with a normal sperm, and then our zygote is going to have an extra chromosome. And in particular, it's going to have three copies of one chromosome instead of the normal two, which it should. And having that extra chromosome, those three copies of a chromosome, is called a trisomy. And so a trisomy is having that third chromosome instead of the normal diploid or two copies. It's always due to non-disjunction. And there are lots of trisomies that are possible. You're probably most familiar with Down syndrome. And Down syndrome is caused by trisomy number 21. So out of our 22 autosomal pairs, if you've got three copies of, cr of, tr of chromosome number 21, then you would have Down syndrome. Now, if we had the gamete that's missing a chromosome involved in fertilization, that would result in a monosomy, mono for one, because that zygote would only have one copy of one of the homologous chromosomes instead of the normal two. It would be missing a chromosome. Now, in our autosomes in humans, chromosomes 1 through 22, that's almost always fatal. In fact, it's usually fatal so early in development that you would never even detect the pregnancy, that that developing embryo would die off probably even before it implanted. But for some reason, it's not uh, fatal for our sex chromosome. The only monosomy we see that's not fatal is if we have uh, one copy of the X chromosome. And that's going to result in sterility. It's going to cause problems, uh, but it's not going to be a fatal situation. So let's take a look at Down syndrome. This is our most common outcome of non-disjunction or trisomy, and it's due to trisomy 21. So if we look at a karyotype, this is a female. We've got two copies of X. but autosomes 1 through 22, and we can see we got three copies of chromosome 21. And for some reason, in especially animals in particular, that extra DNA can be a real problem and causes lots of developmental problems. In this case, extra 21 results in developmental problems in terms of mental development. It often results in cells aging, so people with Down syndrome often look much older than they really are. It also interferes with normal eye development, and a lot of times people with Down develop cataracts, and so we see very severe problems with uh, eyes thick glasses, squinting, and, and vision problems. And so, for some reason, extra DNA can be a real problem for our cells. The odds of a non-disjunction occurring, and hence having a child with Down syndrome, are pretty small. They're not going to occur very often. And the only environmental thing that seems to be associated with Down syndrome or this non-disjunction is the age of a mom when she's giving birth. And older moms are going to be at much higher risk of having a child with Down syndrome than younger moms. And if we take a look here, uh, here's infants with Down syndrome per 1,000 births compared to the age of mom. And we can see up to about age 35, it's very rare. It occurs on occasion, but non-disjunction doesn't happen often. Again, usually things happen the way they're supposed to. But after 35, we start to see that curve dramatically increase. Okay? Now realize that a lot of this increase is due to mom's eggs being older. And so those older eggs, apparently, once they start dividing uh, after they're fertilized, must have the chromosomes stick together more often. Now, it may also be the case that dad, as, as fathers are getting older, that sperm are having more mutations as well. But if a, if a man releases 200 million sperm, the odds of the mutated one being the one to fertilize the egg is going to be very slim. First of all, a minimum of 1 in 200 million. But second of all, if it has a genetic problem, 
is probably not going to be the most fit. It's probably not going to be the fastest swimmer to get there. But if mom has a genetic problem, it's much more likely to be passed on because that egg is going to get fertilized if there are sperm nearby. Now, Down syndrome is not by far the only type of chromosomal abnormality. In fact, here's a chart looking at, uh, they look, this study was very thorough. It looked at 100,000 pregnancies and followed them full term. And what it found out was that of those pregnancies, about 85,000 went full term. So about 85% went full term, about 15,000 or 15% 15 did not. And this was looking at natural causes of uh, ending the pregnancy, things like miscarriages, stillbirths, and so on. And what they saw, out of those 85,000 uh, that were born, only about 500 of them had a chromosomal problem. But out of the 15,000 that didn't go full term, so they died because of some developmental complication, fully half of those had a chromosomal problem. And so by far, problems with chromosome number is the leading cause of pregnancies not going full term in terms of miscarriages and stillbirths and uh, other types of complications that occur with pregnancy. Now, the first group up here look at trisomies, 1 through 22. And I want to point out that Down syndrome, or trisomy 21, is not the most common non-disjunction or the most common genetic mistake. But the reason we see it more common than others is because it's the least fatal. Notice that by far our most common mistake is chromosome 16. Chromosome 16 stuck together and formed trisomies over 1,200 times. But notice that no one with trisomy 16 was born alive. And so trisomy 16 is a common mistake. Those, two, those 16s must be extra sticky. They tend to stick together more often than other chromosomes. But if you have an extra 16, it's going to be fatal. So we don't have a name for any dis disorder for trisomy 16 because no one's born alive with it. By comparison, trisomy 21 happened about 460 times, so much less common, but notice that that's the largest group of survivors. So that's why we have Down syndrome as the name of a disorder because it's the least fatal. But even Down syndrome, trisomy 21, three out of four embryos that had an extra 21 did not go full term. And so again, by far our leading cause of these pregnancies not going, going full term. Now, we could have a monosomy, that example of having uh, just one chromosome, and that's the example of an XO. An XO means you've got an X and nothing else. And that's the only human monosomy that's not fatal. It happened a surprisingly large amount of time, over 1,300 times, and it's usually fatal, but we see eight individuals out of 100,000 were born with just XO. And that's usually going to result in female development because there's no Y chromosome, so we'll see uh, female uh, sex characteristics, but usually it's going to result in sterility and the sex organs don't fully develop. The other chromosomal issue I want to point out on this chart are called polyploid events. And a polyploid event is when you have a whole extra set of chromosomes. So it's not having one extra chromosome, but it's having a whole 23, uh, one copy of every chromosome extra. In humans, that's always fatal. We can see at the bottom here, triploid is having three sets of DNA instead of two. Tetraploid would be four. Now notice that triploid happened over 1,200 times, which is kind of a surprisingly large number. Now, this is not due to non-disjunction. There's no way that all 23 chromosomes would happen to stick together in the same cell to get an extra set of DNA. But a triploid event is due to two sperm entering the egg at about the same time. And if two sperm enter the egg simultaneously, that fertilization barrier, when it pops up, is too late. And so now I've got three sets of DNA in that egg, and that's going to be triploid. On more rare occasion, maybe three sperm enter at exactly the same time. That would end up in a tetraploid. And again, in animals, notice that those extra copies of DNA are always fatal. Interestingly enough, though, in plants, having extra DNA actually allows plants to grow bigger and faster and more vigorous. For example, many common uh, crops like wheat and soybean are tetraploids. They, and DNA and extra DNA in those plants seems to be a benefit for them.